so I want to start by saying thank you for the great opportunity to present some of uh, my PhD research and, and share that with you today. And uh, the title here is uh, slightly broader than what I, I initially proposed or what was in the program. And that is really because uh, we believe that um, the, the approach we take is really a very general approach and, and can be applied to a lot of different lipid species um, to uh, put their aspects of their signaling function or metabolism under optical control. So this, this audience is uh, certainly very familiar with the uh, great um, structural uh, diversity and complexity of different lipid species and in particular different sphingolipids um, and doesn't need an introduction into that. Um, also, um, the, the obviously the very diverse and, and different functions of different sphingolipids. Oh, sorry. Um, so this is a, this is just a basic sphingosine, but we know that, that even the backbone of a sphingolipid can be different. Uh, depending on the amino acid preference by SPT. Uh, there are very, various different head groups that can be installed on the primary alcohol, for example, a phosphate giving rise to a very potent signal lipid here, um, or various um, um, uh, carbohydrates to give rise to glycolipids. Um, and also there can be different numbers of lipid tails. For example, most commonly um, the amine can be acylated. And so this leads to the question, how can these different uh, lipid species be studied? And uh, for an organic chemist uh, like myself, um, it's very nice to see that a lot of chemically modified functionalized lipid species are used in the field um, for various purposes. And so for the powerhouse of, of lipid research, lipidomics, um, often isotope labeled lipids or oddly chained lipids are, are used for quantification. Um, there's a whole array of fluorescent lipids, um, of photocross-linking lipids that allow you to study uh, lipid-protein interactions. Um, and then one tool that is sort of complementary to the type of tools that I'm going to be presenting about today are photocage lipids. And in photocage lipids, you have a photolabel protecting group uh, typically installed uh, on the head group of a lipid. And this photolabel protecting group uh, can be removed upon irradiation with light, giving rise to the free lipid. And um, if uh, looking at these different type of chemically modified uh, lipids, uh, I would divide them into lipids that allow you to um, visualize, uh, detect, quantify a lipid species, and then those tools that allow you to modulate the function of a lipid. And so these photocage lipids fall into that category. And um, an approach, uh, a different uh, analogous approach uh, or complementary approach uh, to the optical control of lipid that was pioneered um, in the Toronto laboratory and other laboratories is the use of small molecule photoswitches in biology. And the most commonly used um, and most widely used small molecule photoswitch is, a, is an azobenzene. And with two different wavelengths of light, you can switch between two uh, forms of this azobenzene that look structurally very different. And uh, these azobenzenes can be modified in such a way, uh, a way that they become bioactive uh, and then in many cases, you find that one of these uh, two structural forms uh, is bioactive. And uh, for example, down here allows to activate uh, an ion channel and the other form of the, of the photo switch is not active. Why do we believe this is um, an important endeavor? So there's two main arguments I think to be made. One is really as a research tool, uh, you attain unmatched control in space and time, which is a particularly interesting um, or desirable in complex cell networks. Um, the other one is since this uh, approach does not require genetic engineering, you could also envision uh, new forms of a targeted therapy where you locally activate um, a, a pharmacophore with light. Um, and a couple of years ago, only, only about five years ago, um, uh, the, the Trauna group started to apply this to lipids. And the idea is that this azobenzy photo switch is actually very hydrophobic. So it ma matches this uh, biophysical aspect of, of a lipid tail. Um, and so initially, um, we have we installed um, the azobenzene uh, into different uh, lipids where sort of a biological switch was known between a saturated lipid and an unsaturated lipid, where the unsaturated lipid was known to be more potent. And you can see that this can be to some extent mimicked with this azobenzene. So the linear form of the azobenzene um, uh, would mimic a, a more saturated, uh, saturated lipid and the band form of the azobenzene would mimic an, an unsaturated lipid. Um, and 
so this was work uh, done pioneered by James Frank, a former PhD student in the Toronto Lab, who is now on the faculty at, at um, the Wallum Institute in Portland. Um, and then um, we, we thought if we could also apply this to lipid where this logic doesn't apply, uh, doesn't, does not apply, where you don't have this uh, saturated versus unsaturated um, dynamic. And uh, one very important class of, of swingolipids that also does not need an introduction here with this audience is swingosine 1-phosphate, which activates a family of GPCRs and is implicated in, in various very important um, biological processes. Um, so to develop a, a, a tool that would allow us to control, control sphingosine phosphate biology with light, we again installed this photo switch in the, in the um, uh, lipid tail of sphingosine phosphate. And um, we were pleased to find that that indeed gave us very good optical control of sphingosine phosphate receptor one in this initial assay. So to test, uh, so, so to test this photo switch, we initially turned to electrophysiology. Uh, because electrophysiology really allows you to um, get a very high temporal um, resolution um, of, of activation of, of a receptor. And so this is done in whole cell patch clamp mode, overexpressing swingosine 1-phosphate receptor 1 and a G-protein coupled inwardly rectifying potassium channel. So the activation uh, of swingosine 1-phosphate receptor 1 is then coupled to this potassium channel. Um, and here in this trace, you can see that uh, light itself does not have an effect. So regardless of which wavelength uh, we, we use, we don't see any effect um, um, on, the, on the current. But then once you um, wash in the photoswitchable lipid, you see that zygosium phosphate receptor is activated. And this one can almost be completely reversed uh, with light um, over multiple cycles, just uh, radiating with different wavelengths of light. And then using a pharmacological um, uh, inhibitor that is selective for sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor 1-3, we, we see that this effect is um, uh, removed, um, showing that this is uh, also selective for the receptor that we are interested in. Uh, we then uh, collaborated with uh, Gabor Tigi at University of Tennessee Health Science Center to, to study the pharmacology in more detail and look at the different uh, sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor subtypes and here in each uh, uh, calcium mobilization uh, dose response, you can see in red uh, the endogenous lipid, then in black, the lipid in trans, so the linear form, and in, in gray, the lipid in cis, so in the band form. And in, um, in coherence with uh, what I showed on the last slide for sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor 1, the trans form is more potent than the, than the cis form. It's a partial agonist, but you see there's a large uh, concentration window where indeed uh, trans is more potent than cis. And the same holds uh, true for sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor 3, where uh, the trans uh, lipid is much more potent than the cis lipid over an even larger um, concentration range. Um, interestingly, for sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor 2, this, is, uh, this effect is reversed, and the cis form is more potent than the trans form. And for 4 and 5, uh, this, is, this is perhaps not a very good tool. We also looked at receptor internalization um, based on, on experience with synthetic agonists such as FDY 720-phosphate um, that sometimes change how, how swingosine 1-phosphate receptors are um, internalized and re-trafficked. And at least for the internalization, we see uh, that our, our photoswitchable analog is indistinguishable from uh, uh, endogenous swingosine 1-phosphate and leads to uh, full internalization of the receptors. Uh, we then wanted to see if we could uh, take this one, one step further and look at entirely an endogenous systems. Um, and so uh, one system that, that um, we became aware of is uh, um, the coupling of sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor 3 to the pain channel trip V1. And, and so a model system in which both of these are endogenously expressed um, are dorsal root ganglion neurons. And so together with the Bautista lab at UC Berkeley, um, we looked at, at, um, um, at the opening of trip one channels in um, uh, coupling to swingosine 1-phosphate receptor 3. Um, and this was done using a calcium dye again. And so in these dorsal root ganglion neurons, you see when you um, apply swingosine 1-phosphate, um, the endogenous lipid here, you see an increase in calcium. Uh, this desensitizes over time. Um, if you apply the photoswitchable lipid in the inactive form, in the cis form, 
you don't see this increase in calcium. And only upon irradiation with blue light, you see this increase in calcium, um, indicating that we could uh, control this process with light here. And if we keep it in the cis form, uh, we don't see this effect. Um, so this, this looks very promising because the levels here are similar to the endogenous lipid, and here we don't see any detectable um, uh, calcium. And uh, so it, uh, taking uh, neurons dissected from sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor 3 knockout animals, we don't see this effect, again, indicating that this is uh, specific for sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor 3. Um, we then also uh, looked at uh, um, behaving animals um, and, and, and looked at how, how if we could control this uh, effect in the peripheral nervous system and look at um, a behavioral readout. And so this is done uh, using uh, power withdrawal latency assays. Um, and you can see uh, before and after injection of the inactive form of the lipid, this is basically baseline. So there's no effect uh, on the power withdrawal latency. But when we use a, 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 an LED and irradiate the pore for two minutes, we see a rapid increase in, in thermal hypersensitivity. And this uh, down here is again indistinguishable from injecting um, trading amounts of the endogenous lipid. Um, so um, we were also very pleased to see this because again, we have sort of com complete control from baseline to uh, full activation of this uh, behavioral um, read out just, just using light with this tool. And we were also able to partially reverse this. So here on the right, you can see an extended time course where we first activate the effect um, and then inactivate this using UVA light. We don't see complete inactivation and we believe this is due to, um, uh, this is due to the um, uh, poorer penetration depth of UVA light. And so, um, I, for, for us, the nice features of this study, also comparing this to some of the optogenetic approaches that are available to, to control um, uh, aspects of the peripheral nervous system, we don't need any genetic engineering, um, and especially important uh, and responses we're looking here are entirely physiological, so all components of, uh, there's no engineered components, um, all the receptors that we um, modulate are uh, um, endogenously expressed. So I hope I could convince you that um, we, we can control sphingosine 1-phosphate uh, signaling with this tool. And um, there's many, you can apply this approach to many other lipids to control uh, aspects of their signaling and metabolism. Um, I just want to point you to a review down here, and I'm also out of time. So I just want to thank many collaborators, um, uh, agencies of funding, and my supervisor, first and foremost, and you for this opportunity.